you know, we'll just see how it's going, and I want to mind the Lord on all things. Um, but I want to start with, the first thing I want to start with is this question, and then we're going to get into uh, some of the others that are kind of going to, going to flow together with each other. Uh, a great question that was asked is, how do I witness to a JW, to a Jehovah's Witness? Uh, take your Bible and go with me to Revelation chapter 7, if you would, please. Revelation chapter 7, and I, I want you to jot these notes down because I'm just going to give you a taste, uh, a small taste of how to go about it, how to set it up, okay? I can't, you can't give you in a uh, question and answer session when I'm going to try to get to multiple questions. I can't give you exhaustive studies on the subject, right? But here's, here's how to kind of crack that shell and see whether or not this person is open to the truth, Right? Mm -hmm. Here's what I want to point out to you. And it, it's hot in here. Is there anybody else? I was watching that thing. It was set on 69. I got to like 75 or 76. There's not much we can do about it, right, brother? It's hotter outside, so our airflow is not going to work. I, our, just, our AC has a hard time keeping up with all the BTUs human bodies put out. And when you pack them all in here, there's literally math on that stuff. Right, Tom? Right, Dan? There's math on that stuff, and you all are the furnace. So the AC unit is fighting you. Pray for a bigger building. That's all I can tell you. Um, <laughs> So if we, if we wind up staying here, we'll add on to it. Fair? Okay, we'll add, we can do that, right, guys? Did I just tell them we can do something we can do? Okay, good. All right. Tom said definitely. I'm like, okay, good. Um, but if we stay here, we'll get that fixed up for you. But anyways, um, so here's the thing that I, that I do when it comes to Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, all of them. You got to get to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is authority. Where do you get your authority for what you believe? Right? This will work for Roman Catholics. What I ask them is, why do you believe that? What do you believe? And they tell me, and I say, why do you believe that? Like, in other words, why do you believe in the 144,000 and what do you believe about it? Why do you believe that souls don't spend eternity in hell? That they extinguish? Or that there's no literal hell? Or you fill in the blank. Why do you believe that? And that what the answer is, well, that's what my church teaches. So specifically for Jehovah's Witnesses, they have two authorities. They have the scriptures and they have the watchtower. Roman Catholicism. They have the scriptures and they have the church. Mormons. They have the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Every single cult has more than one authority. The difference between a cult and a Bible-believing Christian is a Bible-believing Christian has the Bible as their sole source of authority in all matters of faith and practice. So what's very easy to do when you're witnessing to somebody who's in a false religion, it's very easy to point out that your authorities don't agree with each other. So what are you going to do? Are you going to believe your religious leaders or are you going to believe the Bible? Does that make sense? Yeah. It's literally that simple. And if you can get them to grab that concept and go, oh, wait a minute, my church teaches things that correct the Bible? If you can get them to, get, to grab a hold of that, now you can start saying, yeah, so are you going to follow them or God? And if they'll say, okay, if, if they disagree with God, then they have to be wrong. Now you can say, okay, what does God say? And if they're not willing to do that, you're trying to witness to somebody that is not even, they don't even care. They don't want to know. They don't, it doesn't matter. They, you know, it's, there's nothing you can do with them until it matters. So what I say to that is don't, be, don't keep pushing that envelope because the more you push that envelope when they're not open to it, the farther you drive them away from you. And then when the baby dies or when the doctor says you have cancer or when the house is in foreclosure, you're not the person they're going to come to because you're a jerk and they're a jerk and all you've done is fight with each other and you've driven them away. Yeah. So be real careful when you witness to somebody and try to pray for and sense that open door. If they're not going to admit that God is right, their church or religious leaders are wrong, if they're not going to admit that, there's nothing you can do. So here's what I do when I'm dealing with a JW. And, and I want to convince them if they say, okay, well, show me where my religious leaders don't agree with the Bible. You're in Revelation chapter 7, right? The Bible says in Revelation chapter 7, come down to verse 4. I heard a number of them which were sealed, and they that were sealed were in hundred and forty and four thousand, right? 
JWs believe in the 144,000 deal. Watch it. Of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah, there were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben, there were sealed 12,000. He goes down and details all the way through verse 8 that these are 12,000 of the 12 tribe of Israel and nails it down so much that he takes the time to detail. Instead of saying 12,000 of each tribe, he says, of the tribe of, of the tribe of, of the tribe of, of the tribe, 12,000, 12,000, 12,000, 12,000. The Bible nails down who the 144,000 is. They are Jews from the 12 tribes of Israel. There is no replacement there. There's no way to wiggle out of that. You have to twist and corrupt the Bible to believe that there's this 144,000 and you're hoping that you're going to make it into that. Go to Revelation chapter 14 if that's not enough for you. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Sion, and with him an 144,000, having their father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Now watch. So detailed, you have to be a biblical corrupter, a biblical pervert, to try to make it say something it doesn't say. You have to pervert the Bible. It's very detailed, so there's no question. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which foul the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. You know what that thing tells you? It tells you clearly that the 144,000 are Jewish male virgins, each of the 12 tribes of Israel. There's no way out of it. I had them knock on my door, and there was a, I remember a taller blonde lady, a white lady, and a shorter black lady, and the shorter black lady was the elder, and I answered the door, and we were living in Brighton, I answered the door, and I, and I knew what they were right out the gate, you could tell, you know, and, uh, and they said, uh, hi, we're here, blah, 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 and I, and I said, just hold on a second, I said, I got a new world translation, let me go get it. They said, oh, you do? I said, yeah, I'll be right back. Grab my Bible, my new world translation, and I said, all right, so let's talk. And I said, all right, let me ask you one question right now. I said, are you part of the 144,000? She said, well, I don't know for sure, but I sure think I hope so, and blah, blah, blah. I said, explain how that works. And she went into what the Watchtower teaches and all that stuff. And I said, ma'am, I said, you don't look like a Jewish male virgin to me. <laughs> I would be much nicer than that nowadays, but I'd make the same point. She's like, what? And I said, let me show you your Bible. I said, what I'm showing you is, I said, and let me tell you something about your Bible. I said, this Bible that you got is corrupt. Amen. And I said, and I can show you why. I said, this is the Bible that your religious leaders translated for your denomination. I said, and they, they must not be very brilliant because they missed some stuff. And I said, and one of the things they missed is right here in chapter number 7 of the book of Revelation... I heard the number of those that were, who were sealed, 144,000, out of every tribe of the sons of Israel, out of the tribe of Judah, out of the tribe of Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, all the way down through. And I showed her in her Bible that her religious leaders clearly stated that the 144,000 are 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes in their own Bible. I said, this is your Bible. I don't even believe this Bible. This is a corrupt Bible. I said, not only that, but look at Revelation chapter 14. This is so small. It's not that my eyes are getting bad. It's that this is really small. And I saw and look, the Lamb standing upon Mount Zion, and with him in 140 and 4,000, having his name, uh, the name of, his name, the name of the Father, <laughs> written in their foreheads. And I heard a sound out of heaven, as the sound of many waters, as the sound of loud thunder. The sound I heard was as of uh, singers who accompanied themselves on the harp, playing on their harps. And they were singing, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures. 
and the elders, and no one was able to, ma uh, to master that song but the 144,000 who had been bought from the earth. And these are the ones that did not defile themselves with women. In fact, they were virgins. They were the ones that keep, the, uh, keep following the lamb no matter where he goes. These were bought from among mankind as first fruits of God and to the lamb. I said, your own Bible says there are 144,000 Jewish male virgins. Now that's a good enough of an example for me to just leave you with that when you're witnessing to a JW. I went and I showed them how their Bible says that there is a literal, burning, eternal hell. They don't believe that. It's in their Bible. The Bible that their religious leaders translated for them states that explicitly, very clearly, without, that was a good word for it, right? I know the context nowadays is bad, but that, that should be a good word for what I'm saying. Very clearly, their Bible states that there's a literal burning eternal hell, that the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And then I take them over once they see that and they're stuttering. And they're swallowing hard. And they're trying to, yeah, well, well, yeah, well, yeah, well. I said, let me show you something else they did to you. Go to John chapter 1. You guys know? Go to John chapter 1. Let me show you what they did. And what they say is they're translating a Bible that's closer to the originals. You know, that's why we need to make a new one. I, tell, I undermine their faith in their religious leaders. And I try to build their faith in God's word. And if people can't tell that you're not a cult leader when you're doing that, uh, come on, man. You don't have to be a genius to figure out when a guy's telling you the truth and when he's not, when he's being sincere and when he's lying to you. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, the word, the word was, and the word was with God, and the word was... This says the word was a God. What's the King James Bible say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know what they slipped in there? They slipped in there a tiny little definite article. A. You know what's not in the originals? A definite article is not in the originals. They lie, 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 and think nothing of it. Because Satan is a liar and the father of it. And by the way, when they put the word was a God, they says, in the beginning was the word, capital W, and the word, capital W, was with God, capital G, and the word, capital W, was a small g. Now, if you show a Jehovah's Witness that, and you say, how does your religious leaders line up with their own Bible? Anything with two heads is a freak. Listen, either their Bible is wrong and I show them then a King James Bible and I show them a God, was God. Word was with God. In the beginning is the word, the word was with God and the word was God. I show them that in a King James Bible. And I show them in a King James Bible how you got the same thing. Uh, there's the 12,000 of the 12 tribes and I show them the differences. They got to make a choice. You're either putting your faith in what man says or you're going to trust what God says and that's on you. And I'll tell you this much, if they won't hear that, there's, there's nothing you can do for them or pray for them and leave it go. That thing is trash. That is so demonic, it's not even funny. All right, so that's the first one. That's how I, that's how I introduce witnessing to a Jehovah's Witness. If you can get them that far, right, and if they're going, okay, all right, all right, then, and, and they're interested, bring them to church, okay? And if you're like, I don't know where else to go from there, you know, pray for it, let me know they're coming, and we'll take it from there, all right? But that right there should give you enough if you think about those concepts and you look at those verses and you show them, that should be enough to figure out whether or not they actually want the truth. That brings me to a second question, which I think is actually good the way it dovetails in because that's demonic stuff. Go to Revelation chapter 22 and I want you to see something. And here was the question. And this is a great question and it's a common question for a lot of people to ask. The question is, you know, the angels sinned and they fell, right? But... But back then, Lucifer's right with God. He's perfect. The angels are all there and they're perfect. Why would, why would that even be an option of sinning? Why wouldn't God have just froze them all in eternal security, eternal life? Anybody ever have that kind of thought? 
You see your hand. Be honest with you. I've had it myself, so I'm raising my hand. Yeah, that's a great question. So here's the answer to it. Um, anytime Grace wants, she can pack up and leave. I'm going with her if she does, because I can't live without her. <laughs> but you understand that I love her. If I love her, I'm not going to chain her to the basement. I'm not going to chain her to the stove. I love her. So I give her free will. I've, I've in process of raising three, and we've raised one, and she's off flying on her own now. Well, I mean, we never forced them to do right. We made sure that when they did wrong, they understood the consequences. Well, where's the model for that? You see, if you try to force people you love and control people you love, you don't love them, you love yourself. When you love somebody, you allow them the free will. The reason God allowed the angels to fall is because of the character of God. Now, I know this is a simplistic answer, but I can't do any better for you than this. It is God's character of love that allowed them to make that choice. What kind of God would he be if he just makes everybody serve him? He sent his son, he sent his son, his son, to die on the cross to take away your sin. He made Jesus Christ be sin for you. Your sin got put on his son. You understand that? No, no, we really can't. We, we really can't grasp the depth of what that is and what that means. And then he doesn't make you serve him. You can take your fire insurance and the blood of Jesus Christ, the most precious thing God has, and you can peel out of here today. You could hit the liquor store and go get smashed tonight. You could run downtown and get you some, some crack and go start smoking some crack or shoot up on some heroin or go step out on your wife or go look at anything you want to look at, do anything you want to do, and he does not make you serve him because he's a good, good God. But if you don't, you suffer the consequences. And so what you're looking at, what you're living in, and what you are is a result of those consequences. In Revelation 22, verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life. How? Freely. Freely. Look at Matthew chapter 25. You want to come, you can come. You don't want to come, you don't have to come. You got freedom. Which is interesting that this is coming up about freedom and liberty and all this stuff because of where we're going with this study and the next questions that come up. You got liberty. Look at Matthew chapter 22 and look at verse 30. He says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. You know what you and I are? You know what mankind is and the history of the world is? We're a replacement. You're a replacement for what fell. You see, back then, before the earth was created, before you showed up, God gave them liberty, and they were all the sons of God. Go to Genesis chapter 2. They were all the sons of God. Because the, a son of God is anything that God creates directly. Does that, does that, does that make sense? You understand that, and I've taught this before. So when they say, oh, we're all children of God, that's a, that's a farce. That's a lie. That's not anywhere in the Bible. You know, oh, we're all God's children. <laughs> you know, like, no, we're not. You know, we're not all God's children. You can't be God's child if you're Antichrist. If you believe in Muhammad, you're not God's child, period. End of discussion. Uh, if you believe in all that Hindu, New Agey stuff, you're not God's child, period. End of discussion. I don't want to talk about it. Uh, if you think salvation's in the church, you're not God's child. I don't care what you say. If you believe the Pope speaks ex cathedra and you follow what he says about salvation, you've got to be baptized. You're not God's child, period, the end of discussion. I don't want to talk about it. If you're a JW, you're not God's child. I, there's nothing to talk about. You're not God's child. You're not God's child until you're born again supernaturally by a direct creation of God, which is going to delve nicely into what we're going to talk about Wednesday night, a relationship with God. You become his child when he directly creates you. Every human being that's born, which reminds me, Aaron and Bethany had the baby at 10.06, I believe. So praise the Lord. Uh, the church just grew today. Hallelujah. 
Um, so that's a, that's a good thing. And I, with everything else going on, I, I failed to mention that he texted me during church, and Miss Grace showed me right after church. Bethany texted her. So uh, thanks for praying about that. So anyhow, that's procreation. It's science set in motion. It's what God did. It's a miracle. It's the power of God, but that's procreation. Creation is when God creates something directly. So you become a son of God the day you get saved because there's a creation, a new man inside of you that God creates. Until then, you're not a son of God. So the angels were all sons of God, and they all had eternal life. And when they rebelled because God's character allows free will, when they rebelled and they fell, they suffered the consequences. There's no turning back. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You know what he said? He said, there's a tree over there that will kill you. The day you eat of it, you're going to die. Now choose. Pick. Obey me or don't. Don't obey me, you suffer the consequences. Do obey me, you reap the blessing. Still applies. That still applies. Whosoever will may come. You want to get saved? Come on. Come get saved. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses it for all sin. He died for the sins of the world. This election stuff is a bunch of garbage. These are guys that are too smart for their own good. Amen. That's overthinking it is what you're doing. You're overthinking it. God didn't pick and choose who can and can't get saved. He made it possible for every single man, woman, and child on the planet to be born again. And it's their choice. And the same thing is true in serving God. It's your choice. And he put him in the garden. He gave him a choice. The angels had a choice. Adam and Eve had a choice. And they made the wrong choice. It's that simple. And so did the, the devils. Go to Job 38. Let me show you. Job chapter 38. Look at verse 7. Uh, verse 6. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, who hath laid the cornerstone thereof? Watch it. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. That's before, before you and I existed. God said, all the sons of God, all the angels that I created were all shouting for joy at one time. Then a whole bunch of them fell. And so you and I, John chapter 1, almost done with this question. John chapter 1, verse 12. You see that sons of God thing? They were directly created by God. So when he recreated, when he, when he create, recreated the earth and created Adam and Eve as a replacement to those sons of God that fell, he gives them a choice, but he says, this time if you fall, you're dying. I'm not going to let you live forever in a sinful state. John chapter 1, look at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You see that? Even to them that believe on his name. There's a replacement. Go to Matthew 22, verse 30. Last one for this question. Matthew 22, verse 30. No, that's the wrong verse. Where's the... Uh, uh, oh, I'm looking in 20... Yeah, I got the wrong verse. Uh, it's the one that says that hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. Anybody know the reference off the top of your head? Either way, either way, it doesn't matter. Let me just tell you. So the, when Jesus Christ said, Depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, hell wasn't meant for mankind. Hell's what God created for those sons of God and the devil that fell. He has no intention of mankind going to hell. But the ones that fell when they knew better and chose not to follow God, but went with Lucifer, who also had free will. No sin, no temptation dragging them down. They just chose. And when they just chose, they fell. God sends them to the lake of fire, and every human being that chooses not to trust Jesus Christ goes with them. It wasn't meant for people. So here's the conclusion, because I know the question that's still hanging out there. Well, if God let them choose in eternity past, before this world was created, if God let them choose back then and they fell, how about later on? Remember that? 
right? We're talking about the millennium and, and after the millennium into it before eternity future starts. Talked about that, I think it was last time on Revelation 22. Remember how I showed you that they're going to be coming to eat from the tree of life? And that it looks like in a hundred generations, whether that be a hundred thousand years, 70,000 years, or 20,000 years, in a hundred generations, God's going to finally get it back to where he wanted it to be, where eternal life is in play, and no longer does sin ever exist again. And remember how we talked about 1 Corinthians, that's when Christ goes back into the Father, and all things are subjected unto the Father. So God has it fixed up where his long-term plan, when we get out into eternity, will be no more sin. You follow me? So it was messed up back there, and God's been on this process of fixing the mess up and getting it back to where he wants it to be, and eventually he's going to have it absolutely sinlessly perfect. Now, here's what matters to you. What matters to you is what do you already have? What kind of life? Eternal. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about it. If angels or people out, if past the millennium and all that stuff are still capable of sinning, what difference does it make to you? Don't sweat it. You got eternal life and thank God for that. Amen. Is that answer clear as mud? Yeah. Thank you. Matthew 25, 41. Yep, there it is. <clears throat> then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Right? That's what hell's for. All right, so here's a great question. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. When we are tempted, are we dealing with the devil or not? Hear a lot of Christians say, well, the devil's giving me a hard time. The devil made me do it. All oh, the devil's after me. And, and I think probably where this question has come from is I say often, you ain't dealing with the devil, okay? Probably not a big enough fish for the devil to fry. And then it's like, okay, well, wait a minute, what are we dealing with? So if God controls the devil, and if my flesh is an issue, then when I'm tempted, is it the Lord? Is it the devil? Do we even not have to worry about the devil? Is it all God? What's the deal with this? So the answer is yes to all of it. <laughs> uh, the truth of the matter is, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, you wrestle against principalities, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now this is going to tie into our politics question. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. So the fact of the matter is, Christian, is that you do deal with devils at a minimum. At a minimum. And notice the word there is wrestle. Do you ever feel that way in your guts, in your mind, in your heart, in your emotions? And it's just this back and forth, and it's, which is going to lead into walking with God question. I told you, man, it's amazing how God does this stuff. It leads into the walking with God question for Wednesday night because I don't have time this afternoon. It's a, it's, a, it's a war, man. It's a back and forth. And we'll get into a little bit more of that uh, uh, Wednesday night. But whichever direction you lean is the direction you're going to fall when you go down. You lean toward the Lord, you fall into his arms. You lean toward the flesh and the world and the devil, you fall that way. Whichever way you're leaning is the way you're going to fall. So you are definitely wrestling against devils. Chances are the devil doesn't know who you are. He's wise enough and powerful enough. He might know the name of every person in the world. I don't know the answer to that. I'm just saying, I believe he knew who Martin Luther was. I believe he knew who John Wesley was. I believe he knew who Jonathan Edwards was. I don't think Jonathan Edwards got up and preached sinners in the hands of the angry, on an angry God and had the kind of impact he had without the devil noticing, I just lost a bunch of kids. That jerk just come and took a bunch of my kids. I don't think he missed that. I don't think he missed it when Martin Luther was translating his Bible and saying Sola Scriptura and trying to do everything he could to get the Word of God into the hands of the common man. I don't think the devil missed that. I don't think the devil missed who Dr. Ruckman was. I don't think he missed it. 
I think he knew exactly who that man was because of the impact he had in standing for the word of God and strengthening people's faith in the Bible. I don't care whether you like him or don't like him. I'm telling you, the work of getting people, regular people like you and me, established in the word of God and saying, we believe the Bible. I don't think the devil misses a guy like that. Uh, I don't care whether you like him or don't like him. Uh, I don't think uh, a guy like Billy Graham, the devil probably knew who he was. Because of the amount of souls that were getting saved, Brother Lent said that's the last real evangelist that's ever been here. Um, I believe that uh, that's why you see the corruption that took place, because of the devil. I think that's why eventually they start hedging their bet on what they actually believe about hell. It's not a literal hell and this kind of thing. I think it's because of the devil. Uh, I don't know that the devil knows most of our names. I do believe he has a, a authority structure underneath him. He's got governments underneath him, and he's got rank, and he's got power, and he's got assignments due to different devils. They're little, they're little extensions of himself, and I think you deal with them. I think they run in families, familiar spirit. The root word of that is family. Uh, if he and his imps have had all these years and years and years and years to watch and study human nature, they know exactly how to push your buttons, and they know what buttons you got. And they know how to tempt you. And so when it comes to temptation, you are 100% dealing with devils. No doubt about it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I think even more so once you're saved and trying to serve God. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse 27. Now... There may be times in your life, or if you grow enough in the Lord, there may be a time when you get extra attention. But I'll tell you this much, I'm not looking for the attention of the devil. That's not a level of pressure I want. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse 27. He said, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The second thing you deal with, it's not just devils, it's you. Paul said, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Your flesh loves that donut that Cody came out and offered to me. (laughs) Me and Chase are standing over there talking about the swing set, and he comes by, and he's got a plate like this. I mean, he's not even like, you know, he should have been in a tuxedo with a napkin wrapped around his wrist. He's not even that kind of guy, you know, and he comes by, anybody want a donut? And I saw it in slow motion. And it was one of, those, one of those glazed, and the sun was glistening off of it like a new car. I am not kidding you. And I said, no, I'm good. And my body said, yeah. And I looked at Chase, and he said, no, I'm good. Wish the preacher wasn't here right now. You know, it was like that kind of thing, right? Uh, that, <laughs> that's the flesh. You'll know it causes cancer. You'll know it causes you to be overweight. You'll know, I mean, we, we were out there at the, at the thing, and after the service, we sitting there and talked to some of the other uh, 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 preachers and youth pastors and stuff and just kind of have a good time. And there's some really bad influences at camp. There's some very, very evil people. Uh, the, 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 they found out that my wife and I, when we eat Skittles, we act like drug addicts. We're just like, because we don't have that stuff in our system, you know. So over there breaking out all this candy everywhere all over the table. Uh, the one brother, Brother Kennan, you guys remember him, he just preached for us. He's like, this place is 10 minutes from my house. And he breaks out $150 worth of high-scale cheeses. I didn't even know this is some kind of a delicatessen thing where you put a certain cracker and cheese and a thinly sliced piece of apple. And it's like, and it all kind of like goes together and you got this little like, I guess you're supposed to put your pinky out when you bite it. And it's like, it's like the devil. You understand what I'm saying? Like, oh, that was so good. And, and I, I woke up for the first time in literally forever from camp last year <laughs> with a headache in the morning and I knew I'd poison my body eating some Skittles and I didn't even have that much of it and some of those sour things and but you know you know what you do the next night <laughs> what we started doing is not eating all day because we knew what we were going to do at the end of the day so we felt better about it you know what I mean <laughs> that's the flesh anything that's bad for you the flesh wants to do and likes it your body's not saved Your soul's saved, your spirit's saved, but your body's going in a grave and it's going to rot. You're going to get a glorified body. Thank God for that day. In the meanwhile, you got a war on your hands. And so what the devils will do is they will set you up to trigger your flesh. 
You say all you want, well, you know, the devil's down at the crack house. Well, there might have been some imps that worked on him to get him there. Might have set him up at the party. Might have brought the wrong demon-possessed person into their life or the wrong kid into youth group into their life. You moms and dads need to make sure they're not getting phone numbers of the wrong kind of kids just because they got it at youth camp. Don't assume it's right. You understand what I'm saying? They'll bring the wrong kind of people. And by the way, 90% of them are great kids. Maybe more than that. Just saying. But devils might have set that up. But once you put that stuff in your system, the devils can step back. Your body will take care of the rest of it. So it's a war. It's a wrestling match. And that's not all. Go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 and look at verse 16. Uh, starting 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And man, I'm sorry guys, I'm not trying to ride a hobby horse, but these poor young people downstairs right now, could you imagine, could you guys imagine if you were a teenager right now and you had Instagram and Facebook and all the rest of this, whatever else they got, the snap thing where the pictures disappear so mom and dad can't find them. Could you guys imagine? What are the chances of you making it? Don't, don't you worry if those little brats cop an attitude and get rebellious with you because their friends all have a smartphone and you're not, you got all these restrictions on mine. It's the world being pumped straight into their eyeballs and into their mind and heart 24-7 and you wonder why we can't raise a godly generation. It's all that's in the world and it's coming at them so fast and so furious. And just let me say, you too. I'm not, I'm not harping on you. I'm not trying to be mean or disrespectful to you. You too. You might need to tune out of some of that stuff. Man, I wish to God there was no such thing as Facebook. You have no idea from my perspective as a pastor how wonderful my life would be if everybody's business wasn't on the internet for everybody else to see. You, it creates such tremendous stress and pressure and headaches, it's exhausting. How do you even know that, ma'am, sir? We wouldn't even be talking about this if that wasn't on Facebook. Well, why did they post it? Well, why did you look? And the God tells me with all long suffering and doctrine... But it's a whole nother level of long suffering because we got a whole nother level of information we shouldn't have. And I try to pretend I don't know as long as I can. Anyways, look at verse 16. For all that is in the world, it's what? It's the lust of the flesh. It's the lust of the eyes. It's the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but is of the world. So they're wrestling against devils. They're wrestling against the flesh. They're wrestling against the world. And the world and the devils both tune to get after the flesh. And it's all working against you. And on top of that, there's a head over it all. James chapter 1. There's a head over it all. Hebrews, James, First and Second Peter, James chapter 1. And the head over it all is the devil. James chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. For every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. See that? Well, the world fleshes you, tempts you, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. The devils tempt you, or the devil, don't they? But the real problem is not the world or the devils. The real problem? They know how to trigger your flesh. Simplify the problem. That's why I say things like, you don't need to be worrying about the devil. Why don't you worry about walking with God? The devil will take care of itself if you're walking with God. Oh, the devils are after me. Oh, I think this is a demonic spirit. I recognize it sometimes. Now, I'm not trying to say I don't. I mean, like, I think that the, the more I do this, the more I can be like, that's a, de that's a demonic spirit. I sometimes think that person's possessed. That's a devil talking to me, not the person talking to me. And I might be right and I might be wrong and I don't get into it all. Because the Bible says, lay thy hand upon him, remember the battle, do no more. 
You don't need to get all caught up in it. The problem is not, oh, I was tempted, oh, I was set up, oh, the devil, oh, the pressure, oh, the world, oh, this, oh, that, oh, the LGBTQ+, plus, oh, that. that's not the problem. The problem is this guy. Why did I go for that? Where's my heart at? Why don't I love God more than that? Why am I that in tune with my flesh? Why am I that in tune with the world? Why am I even looking at that? I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be looking at that. I shouldn't be thinking that way. I shouldn't be responding to that. That shouldn't be bothering me. It's me. You understand what I'm saying? It's me that's the problem, not the world. It's really not your brother and sister in Christ and what they put on Facebook. It's the fact that you looked at it. And then you go back, oh, did you see? Did you see what she did? Did you see what she said? Did you see where she was? Did you see what they did? did see? Why are you looking? And then we wonder why God's spirit isn't in control and our churches aren't healthy and growing and we're not happy. You go home and you're not home. You're in everybody else's business. Go home, shut the door, and let the world burn down. Amen? And enjoy your home. But that's a choice you got to make. And it's, it's deeper. It's inside here. It's me and God. It's not all the other stuff. So yeah, the devil tempts. And yes, the world tempts. And yes, there's imps out there. But what they do is they go after the flesh. And it isn't God doing it. So, so when I say it boils down to you and God, God's not tempting you. But God does allow the devil sometimes to do some things. It's a test, not a temptation. And the illustration is Job. Is that making sense to you? So when something happens to us, and let's say it is the devil, all the kids die, the house burns down, storms come through, all the animals are gone, the bank account's empty. And you're like, this is the devil. Might be. But it passed across God's desk before it got to you on that level. And that means that God has a good purpose in all of it for you because God's never out to destroy his children. Let me show you what I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. John, how long have I been going? Do I even want to know that? Oh, 35, that's all? Oh, good, okay. We got another hour and a half to go. We're good. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 13. Here's a great verse for you in answer to that question. Am I dealing with the devil? Should I even worry about that? The flesh, the world, God? Here's the answer. Oh, I got to read verse 12 too. They're all so good. Let's just read our Bible. Start in Genesis chapter 1. <laughs> Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth. Man, what a verse. Whew. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Did you hear that? That's a good one, ain't it? You preach, you preach uh, if a man look at a woman and commit adultery with her, he committed adultery already in his heart, and the women, amen, amen. Like, I would, I would not do that. You know why I wouldn't do that? Because it ain't just a man thing anymore. You want to put the shoe on the other foot, or you want to let me respect the ladies in the room? I'd rather respect the ladies. Be real careful. Somebody's, you know, you know sometimes amens are you taking a shot at the person across the room. That ain't very spiritual at all. You just expose yourself for what you actually are. There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. I remember talking to an older preacher about a preacher that messed up and wound up out of the ministry and divorced. And I was upset and bitter about it. And he said something to me I never forgot. He leaned back in his chair. He looked at me and he said, Mike, can you imagine how long he struggled before he went under? And I put my head down and I shut up because I was right. I was right. And he was wrong. And he shouldn't have done what he did. And I'm mad and I'm bitter and I got a right to be bitter. And I just never thought about it from the perspective of the Christian that didn't make it. How long did he struggle before he, before he went under? And that, that was, that was oh, how, how long have I been here? 16 and a half years? That was 19 years, 19 and a half years ago. And I never forgot that statement. Be careful when you see somebody fall. Be careful. There's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. All right, so they got a moral problem. Yeah, but you got a lion problem. 
Okay, so they got a drug or alcohol problem. Yeah, well, you got a gossip problem. Well, they got a drug and alcohol problem. Yeah, well, you have a moral problem. Well, they have a moral problem. Yeah, but you got a hundred other problems. You're not better than anybody else. I hate that stuff. I'm just so sick of that stuff. I mean, th this world doesn't have the cures for any of it. You understand that? The Bible has the cures for all of it. Why, where is it these people like come across thinking you're better than other people? This world's so far off the deep end, they're crazy. They think they're going to stamp out racism and all that. No, you're not. You're making it worse. The Bible will stamp it out. Why don't you look at what the Bible says about mankind and realize you're not any better than anybody else? Why don't you have a rag on your head right now? Why aren't you out in some desert somewhere with a rag on your head a bunch of times a day? Why? Because you and God negotiated in heaven that you would be born here. You earned it. You got nothing you did. God didn't give you. You're not better than anybody else. I can't stand that stuff. And what, what car you drive and what house you live in and how much you got in your bank account and what your background is and your genetics are or any of the rest of that stuff, none of that, none of that makes you any different than the next person. We're all human. We're all mess-ups. We're all soup sandwiches. We all need Jesus. We all need help. We all need a Bible. That's that. <laughs> and the beautiful thing about God is, it says, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. I like and don't like that verse. Because <laughs> sometimes I want to just go, this isn't fair and I can't take this and I don't know why you did this. But the fact of the matter is when God puts something on my plate, it's because God knows I can handle it and I'm going to be okay. And that's why he let me go through it. And that's why he let me on my plate. And he has a way of escape whenever I'm up against it. There's a way out. And that's God. And that really does tune perfectly into Wednesday night. It's your walk with the Lord that really matters. That will get you out of the jam. So is it the devil? Probably could be. Probably for us, once or twice in your life, if you ever go through something that dark where it's you and the devil once in your lifetime, you're a very unique person in my opinion. You're very rare. Most of us don't deal with them on a constant basis. We all deal with principalities and powers. And as you grow spiritually and learn more, you get to graduate to a higher level and they get tougher, they get subtler, they get smarter, they get more aggressive. Welcome to the Christian life. I had some preacher say about me one time, he said, the reason people are getting saved at Reagan's church is because he's not telling them how tough it is to be a Christian. He's telling them the Christian life is so wonderful. <laughs> I kind of thought it was, but anyways. So I took it to heart, man. It hurt me bad, and it was rumored through this person and that person. You know, those rumors always come around to you. Reagan's not my favorite person. You know, okay, whatever. And, uh, and as well, that God's blessing is true. So I got up that Sunday, and I let a message rip about take up your cross and follow him, and how tough it was going to be to live the Christian life, and how you're going to have to deny the flesh, and the devil's going to come after you, and the world's going to come after you, and it's going to be nothing but... And you know what? I think, I think it was like two people got saved that day. <laughs> I said, whoa, glory to God. It is tough, but it's worth it. It's wonderful. And the, God knows how to make a way of escape for you that when the pressure's on and when the world tries to take, trigger your flesh and the devil tries to trigger your flesh, the devils try to trigger your flesh, or if you're a freak, if you're something else, I mean, if you're on a level that is just mind-blowing to everybody and you deal with the devil himself, um, I can promise you, your Heavenly Father will get you through it. Okay? Leads me to my last one. John, where are we at? It's the count up, not count down. All right, so give me just a couple more minutes here, okay? I know it's hot and you all just ate and all the rest of that. I appreciate your patience. What about politics? It's the political season. Uh, Donald Trump is running, and now he's running against Kamala. And the fight is on, the Trump is on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's that? <laughs> Whatever you just said did not compute in my brain. 
I appreciate that. Thank you for the warning, but I'm good. We'll just, we'll just, we'll just deal with it. <laughs> um, yeah, so if this winds up not on YouTube, it's because they flagged it and pulled it down. It'll be on Sermon Audio. I didn't change what I say because it's stinking YouTube. So what about it? What about politics? First of all, let me say this. you got to think about things from a biblical standpoint. This is a hot subject, so I'm trying to slow down and be very careful about what I say and how I say it because I don't want to come across wrong. I have told you a hundred times or more, one of the things I believe I would give my life for is this country. You guys that are vets, and we got multiple vets in the room, and, and when everybody's here, even more. Not only vets, but like combat, not only veterans, like guys that were in the military, but combat vets. You don't know how much I appreciate you. I, I don't know how to even express it. When somebody just tells me they did time in the military, especially like my preacher in Vietnam, in the trenches, like legit, like burning leeches off them with a cigarette lighter. I appreciate it. I love my freedom. I'm American. I love the freedom to preach the Bible how I want, as long as, you know, I don't get censored and, you know, anyways. Um, I love it. I thank God for this country. I don't think in church I need to tell you how to vote. If I'm preaching the Bible to you, and you let the Bible be your guide and your standard, then I'm already doing everything I need to do for this country, and your vote has already impacted the right way. I don't need to waste my time in the pulpit preaching about that stuff, number one. Number two, if a lost person comes in that's a liberal, and I'm up here ranting and raving about Donald Trump, I just stepped into a trap from the devil before I even have a chance to get the gospel to them, get the Bible in them, and begin to help them grow in the Lord where their politics will fix itself, before I even have a chance, they're gone. Ears are cut off. Back when Barack Obama was trying to get into office, we had a guy in the church, we were in the storefront, and we had a guy in the church who was uh, out in the parking lot. I still still <laughs> get angry when I start thinking about it. Passing out CDs about Barack Obama being the Antichrist. What a biblically illiterate moron. He's a, the Antichrist is a Syrian Jew. I don't care whether you like Barack Obama or not. I don't care whether you like him or not. He couldn't possibly, according if you know the Bible, he couldn't have possibly been the Antichrist. Get a life, man. And he's passing that stuff out. In the, and there was a young guy there who is, a, who is a, his family still in this church and trying to get him into church. <laughs> And he is a successful young guy, and he is, you know, I think he's on a good track to be well to do. If he's not by now, he probably is by now. Back then, he was probably thirty something. Now he's up in his forties, and a real good career, and uh, and a, and a smart guy, but a liberal. And somebody handed him that thing, and he never came back to our church. And when he got that, he wouldn't even listen to me. Way to go, genius! And I told him not to do that stuff. And he's not a pastor. And he doesn't think about things and look at them from an eternal perspective or from the perspective caring about that soul. All he cared about was making sure the right person got in office and his motive. This is what ticks me off. His motive was his money. The economy, the economy, the economy, the economy. The motive was the money. It had nothing to do with anything else. It was all about getting rich and staying rich and keeping taxes down. That's all he cared about. And that soul still hasn't come back around because that gentleman, forget the preacher, I'm not in the building, I'm in the parking lot, I'll do what I want. You bring out the warrior in me like that, man. That's not okay. You understand that? If I could get that guy saved... If I could lead him to Jesus Christ, his politics will fix themselves. Right? That's a big deal to me. Um, there's a lot of complaining right now about the border. Now, I'm going to show you some verses here in a minute, okay? A lot of complaining about the border. You know what I think? I think they're streaming across our borders because we stopped streaming across theirs. 
I just look at things differently. And if you don't, if you don't agree with me, I love you. I mean that as your pastor. If you don't agree with me and these are hot topics for you, I want you to know I love you and I ask you to kindly and compassionately and graciously and charitably try to understand where I'm coming from and realize I'm not doing it from a heart and not being patriotic or not caring about my country. I do. I think they're streaming across our borders because we stopped streaming across theirs with the gospel. This country used to send missionaries all over the world to reach people. And we don't anymore. I think I was driving out here to go to the nursing home the other day and I went down 10 mile and there was a big event going on and there was Hindus and Indians. I mean, man, they were everywhere. And these guys were talking and I'm sorry guys if you were talking and I tuned out. I think Brian has stopped a couple times and just waited. He's like, he's distracted. He's got to know me that well. He's like one of my kids now. He's like, dad's not listening. <laughs> you know what it was? I saw them Indians and I said, how come we don't have one of them in our church? There's thousands of them right up the road. I ain't coming over here. All them, all them, all them, all them Muslims down there, or Middle Easterners. I said, Lord, how come we don't have them in our church? More and more and more. Pardon me, I'm being kind about this. I don't want everybody to get hypersensitive on me. More and more blacks out this way. Why don't we have more of them in our church? That's what, how I talk to God. Well, I think our church should represent our community, don't you? Yes, sir. I think we're just not doing our job. I think there's a whole bunch of Asians right here in Novi. That's hard to reach them because they're family-oriented and they're real tight. But if you can get one of them saved, if you can reach one of them, they'll bring their family. Yeah. You know what they'll find out? They'll find out if you actually love them and care about them, actually love them and care, like really love them and care about them, not patronizing them because they're Asians, you know, we're going to be nice to the Asian people. Like, not, not that. Like, actually love them and care about them. Oh, don't you see through that stuff? I see through that. I just don't look at stuff like other people look at it. I don't, know, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just don't see it right. I see it like real. Well, if we love them and care about them and you reach one of them, you might, we, we, I mean, I just think we should look like the League of Nations on Sunday mornings. This is Metro Detroit. That's good preaching, isn't it? Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, but politically speaking, you know, it's like they're coming across our borders. I realize that as an issue. They're illegal. What about the, what about the gangsters? And that's, it might be called the judgment of God. Because we stop caring about them and going to reach them. If they're coming across our borders illegally and we give them the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'll bet you they'll get legal real quick. Yeah. Once the Spirit of God works on them. That's just how I see politics. Let me show you some verses. Romans chapter 13 for starters. I don't want to discourage you from voting. Did you hear me? I don't discourage you from voting. You do whatever you want to do. If you want to vote, go vote. It's a free country. Thank God it's free. Vote while you can. <laughs> but I look at things differently. I look at this. I look at it like this. I started this. We started this. The Lord started this church in January 2008 because it was the Great Recession. And nobody had any money. I was the only one at the time that I know of actually making a decent living. It was just God and the devil both. They were both working. God was working to set me up so I could make a decision that I wouldn't have been able to make if he hadn't have blessed my job a little bit. And the devil was working to get my heart. I got out of bed in the morning. I looked at Gray. I called 5 o'clock in the morning. I dialed. I had no numbers to my bank. My routing number and my bank number memorized. And I punched in the numbers. There it was. And it said 15000 something, something, something was one week, one, one, one month's commission check. That didn't include my base, and, and that was just one month of my bonuses. That was one month's commission check, 15000 and some change. And I said, hey, baby, I got it. She looked at me, she said, good for you, honey, I'm sleeping. And she rolled over, jerked the covers like that, and pulled them back over herself and turned away from me. And I thought, what is wrong with her? Like, you can sleep with that kind of news? <laughs> And I got out of bed, man, and I, I knew it was coming, but they always messed up my commission. I always had to go after them because they always messed something up, you know. Now, I knew what number it was supposed to be, and it was right on. And I got out of bed, and I walked to the door. I opened up that door, and I looked back at her, and I said, I'm going out to get me a bigger one. And I shut the door, and I walked down that little hallway, and I turned left into the bathroom there of our first house, and I looked in the mirror, and the Holy Spirit said, the love of money is the root of all evil. I said, oh, God. I told you this morning, put the Bible in them. It'll hold them up. 
And I looked up in the mirror and I said, what are you doing, man? Washed my hands, got ready, read my Bible, prayed, ate breakfast, got in the car, went to work, went after a bigger one. Really did. I had the biggest deal of my sales career sitting on the plate. I mean, it was a, it was a month or so from closing. It had been three years of work trying to bring it in. Uh, two years or something. I think two years. I went and gave my boss my laptop when the Lord said, you're done. It's either that or the money. God and the devil both working. You see what I'm talking about? And I said, I'm done. God asked me to give it up. He said, you're on track to make more money than I am this year. My boss. I said, I know. Are you sure? Yep. Scary stuff, man. God and the devil both working. Folks, I get and I understand this, this worry about the economy and all the rest of that stuff. God put us in a position where nobody in the church had money. But we were seeing souls saved because people were scared. Offerings weren't very big, but the building was packed. The storefront, I mean, there were arms and legs sticking out the windows. That's how much we were packing them in there. Nobody had money. I didn't even care if we had money. So many people were getting saved, and I was so fired up and so excited and so just, just chomping at the bit to reach people because God was using a bad economy, bad politics, and bad leaders to shake people up and get a hold of their hearts. So I'm sorry if I'm just like, oh, Kamala got in. <sighs> Good, maybe we'll see some more people get saved. Because these Americans are going to be freaking out about their retirements and these kids are going to be worrying about how crazy this world is and what's going on around us and this doesn't make any sense. You know how many people are thinking? You know the devil's working in this country? Are we dealing with God or the devil? Both. You know how much the devil's working in this country? Bad. You know greater nations than this country have already fallen. I, I, mean, I mean this country has already fallen way beyond what much greater nations than us. They lasted like a thousand years. Was it Rome and some of those other great countries? We've already fallen in 200 years. What I'm trying to say, I'm sorry. What I'm trying to say is we've already fallen in 200 years faster and harder than those countries have. Your nation, no matter how you <clears throat> vote, no matter who gets in office, your nation is shot. And the reason is because of the amount of light this country has had, God will not put up with it. God's going to judge it. It's the state of the world. Your vote's not going to change it. Do you see what they did in Paris? To the opening show of the Olympics? You know, if we had any chance of God blessing in this nation, when that happened, the, God, the president would have called over there and said, pull all the Americans out right now. And here's why we pulled out. You're going to mock God like that, you bunch of perverts. You're going to mock God like that, we're out. Ain't going to happen. God's going to judge this nation. You're asking God to deny his character if he doesn't. All right, now let me show you the balance. Romans 13, 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there's no power but of the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive damnation to themselves. How about that? You mean God works in politics? You mean God gives them kings after their heart? Now, does that scare you half to death? It ought to scare you. God will give them the king they want. They said, get a king over us. God said, I'm supposed to be your king. This ain't no democracy. You know, America's not even supposed to be a democracy. It's supposed to be a constitutional republic, which is the rule of law. Democracy. That's Laodicea. That's the rights of the people. God said, I'm your king, and I gave you a book. That's what you go by. And I'll send priests and preachers and prophets to you to direct you according to that book. They said, no, put a king over us. God gives him Saul. Saul was God's pick because he was little in his own sight, but the devil got in there. And when the devil got in there, he became one of the greatest types of the Antichrist in the Bible, and the damnation of God come on him. Then God replaces him with David, a man after God's own heart. And after that, Solomon starts out right and turns wrong. And you watch the history of Israel like this with those kings, as good kings got in and bad kings got in, and God's moving the chessboard. It's above your pay grade. God's moving the chessboard nationally. 
God's moving the kings over here to come against Israel and judge them and bust them up. And God's raising up kings over here to get right with God, to give an example, to teach the people something, to drive them out. And God's moving those chessboards around the world. He's moving those pieces. And Lucifer will slew it sliding through there. And he's got the principalities and powers going. And he and God are playing this great big game. Did I mention it's above your pay grade? If Donald Trump gets in, was that God? Maybe the devil. I don't know. <gasps> How could you say that? If that's your response to me, you need to go home and get on your knees before God and yeah. gut check yourself for a minute. Yeah. That man is not God. Yeah. That, that man will play both sides of the fence. He's a, he's a brilliant man. He's the lesser of two evils. Okay, I get that. So, like, you go ahead and you do what you think God wants you to do at the pool. That is not a thing for this church. At the voting with one way or the other. I don't care what you do. I do not care what you do. If that's a thing for you to vote for Donald Trump, then go vote. But don't start that around here. We're not, we're not making that a thing. We're making Jesus a thing around here. Yeah. Understand that? And if Jesus is a thing, I guarantee you, you'll know what to vote, what to do at the voting booth. You'll know. 100%. Not a, not a question in my mind. I'm not part of the problem. I've had preachers call me and tell me I, when Obama was getting in, I had some preacher's wife lit me up. You're part of the problem with this country. <laughs> Suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over a man, but to be in silence is all subjection, ma'am. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyways, back to the Bible. Matthew chapter 22. Look at verse 21. Look what the Lord tells you. What they did is well, they set the Lord up, and they come to the Lord asking him a question, and it was a question that was actually legal. Because they had a right. They had a right to fight against the situation according to their laws. And when they came and presented their political right to the Lord, the Lord's response was, verse 20, He saith unto them, Whose is the image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. They wanted to get the Lord caught up in politics. And believe it or not, if you understand the setup that, that was going on politically back then, they had a good point. And when they came to the Lord and said, how about this? The Lord said, pay your taxes. Yeah, but we got a right. Those soldiers could legally make them go with them a mile. They could literally legally walk up to a Jew and say, carry my stuff for a mile. And he said, when they come up and say, go with me for a mile, you say, I'll go with you twain. Legally, they didn't have to. How about freedom? What about liberty? I'm just trying to tell you, folks, God is not an American. <laughs> so when we come to church, this is God's place. It's about the Bible. And if I'm giving you the Bible, I am 100% sure you're not going to go out and vote for some liberal that's trying to pursue the abortion agenda and the LGBTQ agenda and all the rest of those agendas. I'm doing my part. Preacher, Brother Reagan doesn't do his part. I'm doing my part. And over my cotton-picking dead body, literally, will you ever set up voting booths in the lobby of my church? In my church. The church God allows me to pastor. Over my dead body. And I know churches that do that. They have their little stations and they're passing on. They're trying to use their influence to make sure everybody, you know, for, the, for what? It's so far over our heads, you don't know whose hands you're playing into. It's something God does. All right, I have a bunch of verses for you, but I, I just don't have time. I think we're up against the clock here. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. Do you remember, let me, give you, let me leave you with this verse, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of these thoughts off the top of my head, then we'll look at 1 Timothy 2, and we'll be done for this afternoon. You go over to the book of Daniel, and you find out that the Bible says that God sets up kingdoms and takes kingdoms down. Right? So you mean the future of this country is in the hands of God, if we vote. People are already saying, now that Kamala's running, that the vote's going to be stacked against her. People are already saying that when Trump got voted in, that he actually got voted, when, when Biden got voted in, that actually they skewed all the numbers and nobody knows whether they did or didn't. I am 100% sure this will not stay up on YouTube. It will get flagged. I've been getting flagged more and more often. I'm so sick of them. I'm 100% sure. I'm 100% sure that we don't know 
whether it was honest or not honest. Sure. And that we'll never know. Amen. I do know this. I rest in the fact that Almighty God is the one that sets up kingdoms and takes them down. And if God lets the devil do something, it was God's choice on his chessboard. What none of us want is us to be the ones on the chessboard that God says, let's show the world what they do when they walk away from my book. If he does, I can still serve God, can't you? I can still win souls, can't you? I can still sit on my back porch or whatever I have, um, you know, my cardboard box out in the field somewhere and look up at the stars and go, ah, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved to the uttermost and I know that I am. What about my house? <laughs> I got a home on the other side, you understand that, that nobody can take away. So, I mean, God might do it. The devil might do it. I know the Bible says God sets him up. You know what Lucifer said to Jesus, which I was going to show you this verse, but I don't have time. You know what Lucifer said to Jesus? Baal worship. See, the kings will show him all the kings of the world in a moment of time. He said, Baal worship me and I'll give them to you because I give them to whoever I want. And Jesus didn't say, oh, no, you don't. Jesus said, I know. Because what you don't know is that God said in the book of Job, I was going to show you that, that he plays with Leviathan. Like, like you would play with a bird, like you'd mess around with an animal. God pulls the strings on Lucifer, and Lucifer thinks, I'm doing what I want. This is great. And God's like, that's set up for that. That's ready to go there. That's that. Move that there. Move that there. Get that for that. And deal with that about that. Boom, 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 boom. So that's where I'm at on it, you see? Can I show you a much more important thing for everybody in the room to do? Much more important than go to the rally and go to the voting booth. I mean this. I'm not being a jerk. I promise. I really hope I haven't pushed anybody's buttons. I'm not trying to. I appreciate you being red-blooded Americans. I mean it. One of the biggest regrets of my life is I did not sign up for the Marine Corps. I mean it that today as a preacher, because of my age, if there was a draft, as a preacher I don't have to go. And because of my age, I don't think I would get drafted anymore. I still think I would volunteer. That's how I feel. I think I would. I hate to see those boys go die without me. That ain't right. I love, I rate them all, man. I love Chesty Polar. What a guy, man. Walking back and forth up there in front of those, those trenches, bare chested with bullets flying while they're all hunkered down, screaming at him and cussing them out, man. No wonder those boys followed him, man. What a guy. I love my country. So the best thing I can do for my country is in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You know what that is? That's freedom. So you can't say a Bible-believing preacher is not patriotic. I love freedom. I'm supposed to pray that we keep our freedoms, that we can be left alone and lead a good, quiet, peaceable life. I don't want to be persecuted to you. I don't want to be shut down to you. I don't want to be hauled into court to you. But Paul was. Jesus was. The apostles were. So if I have to, I mean, I sure don't want to. So let's pray. Let's pray, God. Let's pray whatever happens in the election works for two purposes. Lots of souls getting saved. But more than likely, if the economy ticks up and everything's looking good, they're not going to pay us any attention at all. And more than likely, some of you aren't going to be able to make it to church because you got a promotion, a job, and you're not going to at work because everything's going good and the economy's going good and you're not even going to be here anymore. Well, I'd rather the wrong person get in and people be going, man, this thing's falling apart and a mess and I need to get saved. Well, let's pray that the right person gets in, that God gives us some time, that we can do something for God with our finances since he's blessing us and blessing our country and that souls get saved no matter who gets in. Amen. Let's pray for them. Look at this next verse and I'm done. For this is good and acceptable with God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You want God's acceptable will for your life? Pray for him. Don't mock President Biden. Pray for him. I don't think it's funny that he forgets what he's saying. I don't like his politics. I don't like his godlessness. I don't like his depravity. I don't think it's funny that he's an old man who forgot what he was saying. That he has dementia. That's funny? That's like something to think, oh, what an idiot. Like, oh, you know what? You better be.
be careful because God might let you have a taste of that. You want a taste of that? You want to sit there and watch that be your parent? That's a brutal disease. He's tripping and falling, walking up the steps. <laughs> well, he's your, he's, he's, he's your leader. I don't have time to show you the verses. The Bible says brute beasts do that. Smite him against the wall. Smite thee against the wall, thou whited sepulcher. Hey, that's God's high priest. I'm sorry, sir. I didn't know that you had that position. That was Paul. Just talking about being a Christian. And so that's why I am the way I am about not getting into all the politics stuff and not pushing that agenda and not preaching on it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. I sure hope it does. If you have questions, please feel free to ask me. Okay? One on one. And I promise you. I'll be gracious to you, even if you're mad as you could possibly be at me. I promise to do my best to be gracious. I said promise to do my best to be <laughs> I am half Italian, and the other half has got some Irish in there. So I promise to be gracious to you. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you this afternoon. We thank you so much for the time we had in church today. What a blessing to be here.